Section 12 of On Being Negro in America by J. Saunders Redding. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 12. Perhaps I make too much of this, and perhaps I am overwrought and unreasonable about it. I must confess that there flit across my mind, like stones skipped on the surface of water, only to sink into it, thoughts of my sons. There are moments when I am sentimental enough to hope that history is a necessary progress toward better things, and that frustrations of the human spirit grow less and less. I know better, but I have such hopes when my sons are involved, and I am inclined to support them intemperately. It does not serve merely to shrug one's shoulders and carp about the psychic traumas that bedevil American man. At least it did not do seven years ago, when my older son was eight, and my younger not yet born. And now that my younger is himself almost seven, it still will not do. Argument does not exactly serve either, although I think I argue for something eminently sane. It is simplicity. I argue the substitution of spontaneous instinctive responses for the deliberate responses based, as I have said above, on unchanging ideas and ideals it seems to me that the old rules evoked as they were out of the utmost confusion of morality and social expedience and deliberate ignorance are not only unnecessarily complicated for modern times and people but they are progressively unsuitable to modern ways of thinking to the advance of knowledge to technology and surely everyone will allow this to one worldness make the rules simple enough and we can play the hardest game what happened to my older son and also to my younger son just recently though not in circumstances so distressing nor in details so graphic was that while he was playing the game with all the exuberance of an eight-year-old somebody complicated up the rules i remember distinctly how it happened for several weeks while my wife was with the child it was my unaccustomed duty to make the marketing as it is so quaintly put in the upper south our market was a co-op on the highway just outside town in the heart of one of those neat and monotonous residential communities that seemed to spring up everywhere in the nineteen forties my wife loved the place it was convenient its stock was excellent and its prices generally somewhat lower than in the chain groceries besides it had a negro a colleague and friend on its board of directors and as a second novel attraction it employed several negroes at least one as clerk and another as butcher the co-op's atmosphere unlike that of the chains was friendly warm leisurely my wife supposed it was because of the neighborhood the better than average middle-class neighborhood segregated of course of aircraft designers engineers and other technological experts and a scattering of armed service personnel no one lower than a lieutenant in the navy or a captain in the army it seemed from the various military installations close by as one of the charter stockholders i was determined to love the place too friday was market day until her condition prevented her going my wife's eager companion on these expeditions was our son sometime in the spring he had struck up a friendship at the co-op and he anticipated its weekly renewal with pleasurable excitement the first time i took him there i saw the revival of the fraternity with quickened heart my son burst through the door ahead of me stopped looked down the first aisle fresh fruits and vegetables ran to the second and looked and then suddenly let out an indian whoop reggie and got one for an answer conway and then i saw a handsome dark-haired dark-eyed boy of about conway's age break from the side of a young negro girl and come bursting up the aisle between the high stacked shelves of brightly packaged foods toward my son they stood looking at each other for a moment then they came together each with an arm around the shoulder of the other and exploded off to play outside among the cars until market was made i looked at the uniformed negro girl and she smiled and i smiled and that was that it was that way for four or five weeks Conway and Reggie met each other with what seemed the force of projectiles and went skyrocketing off. Leaving the market, I would find them outside, hot and happy, playing at some impossible game. Then one Friday, Reggie, we never learned his last name, was not there with a negro maid. His guardian this time was a man, a tall, handsome person, about forty, 
i judged who in spite of the phi beta kappa key slung across his flat stomach looked outdoorsy and virile the boys came together as usual and went outside as usual but the man's marketing must have been nearly done for before i could finish picking out the heaviest juiciest oranges conway was back with me again where's reggie i asked him he had to go he said his daddy was in a hurry but already he was looking forward to the next week the uniformed maid was with reggie again the next week but this time when conway let out his customary whoop there was no vocal answer reggie turned it seemed to me with momentary eagerness but there was no yell and rush he approached very slowly he was smiling weakly but that smile died as he came perhaps sensing that something was wrong conway himself now hesitated what's the matter he asked reggie come on man let's go don't you want to play i can't play with you reggie said what's the matter are you sick conway wanted to know i just can't play with you any more reggie said conway moved a fraction closer to me clutched the handle of the food cart i was pushing the maid stood at some distance pretending not to watch the pleasant-voiced pleasant-faced shoppers of the neighborhood flowed around us other children younger skittered and yelled up and down the aisles the compacted odors of fresh pastry of ground coffee of fruits and vegetables and the colors of all these were as ever but a chill was beginning to form around my heart before conway asked the next question i knew the answer that was coming i did not know the words of it but i knew the feel the iron that he would not be prepared for the corrosive rust that it would make in his blood and that unless i was skilful as my father was not i could never draw off at that moment no before the moment of the answer i wanted to pick conway up and hold him hard against me and ward off the demoralizing blow that might be struck for a lifetime but i could not forfend if even by grasping my son by the hand and walking off in another direction i was transfixed why reggie scowled then a grimace that was not really ugly yet because it was associated only with words and not with feeling that would come later and the word would be made flesh and the flesh would be his forever now the scowl was only imitation because you're a nigger that's why reggie said conway looked at me wonderingly not feeling hurt as they say a man knowing himself shot but still without pain will look with surprise i'm better than you reggie said cause my father said so you are not conway said but i thought he shrank a little against me no son he isn't i said i am so too reggie said looking at both of us words were beginning to arouse emotion and link with emotion the sneer was no longer imitation he stood bearing his weight on his left foot his hands in the pockets of his khaki shorts the whiteness of him showing in a streak just below the hairline the rest of him bare trunk bare legs tanned almost to the color of my son no son i said as much to the one as to the other i think i felt sorry for reggie too i do now at any rate thinking back you are not conway said and straightened my daddy says you aren't you don't go to my school you don't go to my church you don't go to the movies i go to i bet you never even seen tim holt he put in parenthetically and that's because you're not good enough ya ya reggie said niggers work for us niggers work for us you're a nigger and trixie's a nigger and trixie works for us it was a shrilling sing-song ya ya nigger nigger go peddle your papers nigger with this he ran off back i suppose to trixie who worked for him because she was a nigger conway did not cry but in his eyes was the look of a wound and i knew how it could grow become infected and pump its poison to every tissue to every brain cell he stayed close to me while i made market on the way home he said savagely i hate this car it did not seem like any kind of entree to what i knew i must talk about and the sooner the better when what happened to him happens it makes a nasty wound which demands immediate attention you want a knife to do the job quickly deftly cleanly but the only instruments in the surgery kit are words so when i wanted to know what was wrong with the car and why he hated it 
and he said why can't we have a good car a new car with a radio and a bigger one like reggie's i tried to explain to him that it was war time that cars were scarce and prices high and that in order to get a new car you had to do something a little underhanded something that was not much different from stealing or cheating did reggie's father steal i wouldn't say that i said but i wouldn't put it past him he's not a good man how do you know you don't know him do you no i said but i don't have to know him to know he's not a good man i put it as simply as i could i told him that parents are frequently reflected in their children i made him laugh a little by reminding him of the time when he was six he had acutely embarrassed his mother and me by telling one of our friends i think you have store-bought teeth which was exactly what he had heard me say about the friend those things reggie said to-day his father said to him that's how i know reggie's father is not a good man he wasn't telling the truth was he no i said shaking my head i mean about him being better no i answered then why can't i go to his school and to his movies this was the deeper infection and i did not know how to deal with it words were poultices to seal the infection in i could recall them from my own childhood in answer to a why for children are not born with answers words spoken by my parents my teachers my friends words could seal in the infection and seal in also the self that might never break through again except with extreme luck but i had no choice save to use them i told him about prejudice no one has ever made the anatomy of prejudice simple enough for children and the reason you don't go to reggie's school i remember saying is because there are people like reggie's father it's all complicated up conway answered it was a relief to laugh at his child's expression but i noticed he was not laughing and at home some minutes later when i finished storing the groceries in the pantry i found him pressed against his mother's rounded bosom crying without restraint but even that did not end it he cried it all out his mother said she was wrong seven years afterward in the late spring of nineteen fifty we had a letter from the headmaster of conway's new england preparatory school we have been unable to reach him he seems to prefer to be alone and will not participate even in those activities for which he has undoubted talents naturally this attitude has given us serious concern for an important part of our educational program is training in citizenship and cooperative living perhaps there is only a slight connection but i would be hard to convince end of section twelve